Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second week of the Low Carbon Design Institute Residency 2022. Um, such a great uh, talk to kick us off. And I'm extremely pleased to uh, introduce John Burke. Uh, John and I have never met, but um, we've sort of, um, in a way, weirdly crossed paths professionally as I was uh, working at Library of Things, which um, is a, a project that uh, he actually helped champion in Hackney. Um, and so uh, that's eventually how I got to following him on Twitter. And uh, I think his Twitter presence is absolutely fantastic and um, extremely rich. So I really, I really recommend you follow him there. Um, a little bit more formally, John is a uh, municipal decarbonization professional and urbanist who currently leads a city climate change program and is helping to shape the environmental policies of a national network of local authorities covering almost half of the UK's urban areas. In his former role at the uh, London Borough of Hackney, he was a cabinet member for energy, waste, transport, and public realm. And he delivered the UK's largest urban forestry program, comprising of over 5,000 specimen street trees and tens of thousands of saplings and the country's most extensive rainwater garden and depaving scheme. And also the first, the UK's first no spray and zero weed removal zone. So just a, an incredible array of experiences. Uh, I have asked him to join us uh, today and his talk very specifically is um, sponsored by Something More Near who are a London based little agency doing some uh, really interesting climate work. So thank you to them for supporting John's talk. Uh, I will now hand over to John. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, and uh, before I share my screen, I think what I what I would say is um, and what people ought to kind of know about me, kind of apropos that um, that short biography, is that when I um, first began thinking about this talk and kind of what I would focus on, um, I'd considered that I'd kind of largely focus on urban green infrastructure, um, but actually. Um, I want to cast the net wider than that. Um, I did a lot of kind of largest and firsts in Hackney and kind of notoriously delivered the largest number of low traffic neighbourhoods in the country, um, which, uh, you know, I uh, received some plaudits and many death threats for. So um, I'm going to be focusing on uh, the full range of uh, kind of public realm interventions that I undertook, because I think that um, you know, people with uh, a design perspective may be interested to kind of hear a bit more about the kind of ecology of urban design. And that is, you know, comprised of a wide variety of different elements and not just green infrastructure. So um, I'm going to share my screen um, and I'm going to share with you a terrible PowerPoint presentation, but hopefully um, that should give you um, some small insight into the work that I undertook and the kind of underlying design philosophy uh, behind that work and then uh, if I can finish within 30 minutes or so, um, although as this opening gambit indicates that may be heroic, um, we will um, have time for questions if people have any. So I'm going to share right now. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to see my tour. Right. Um, now, this talk is entitled Radically Reimagining the Public Realm. Um, and that kind of, um, uh, the reason I kind of use that, that term um, is because the work I undertook in the London Borough of Hackney, as I've just noted, um, kind of featured, well, work on all of the kind of key decarbonization themes of, um, uh, local governments, that's energy, waste, transport, and public realm. And that was the title of my role in the London Borough of Hackney. And it kind of wasn't created um, in a single instance. It was the result of me kind of gradually hungry hippoing, if anyone remembers the hungry hippo game and didn't get it for Christmas, even though they wanted it. Not that I'm bitter about it. I'm um, gradually kind of hungry hippoing different areas of the um, of the, the local authorities' functions up um, um, and integrating my kind of um, 
um, approach to uh, um, decarbonisation into those areas. Um, and as you'll note in the kind of on the cover of the opening slide, and I think it's appropriate for this talk, you'll see an image of people walking in a road, a church in the background, some cars either side, um, but it's an unusual sight for um, you know, Europe's only megalopolis and one of the largest, um, one of the largest cities in the world. Um, it's not often that you see um, people cycling. Uh, ambling up the street, having conversations, uh, and generally being unafraid of the motor vehicle, which has come to absolutely dominate life in our cities and crowd out its rich social life. Uh, now, I wasn't responsible for this particular um, act, um, but I think it's useful. It's a useful starting point for my talk because what you see in this image is um, part of the De Beauvoir low traffic neighborhood, which was the first low traffic neighborhood implemented in Hackney in 1974. Um, uh, and until I delivered a further five low traffic neighborhoods, there'd only been two in the previous 50 years, of which this was one and the first. And this was the result of parents uh, in the area demanding um, that roads be um, closed to through traffic because of a, a high number of injuries and fatalities of children in the area at that time. Um, and what we can see from the image in the cover is that by eliminating through traffic, whilst also still ensuring that cars can, can access um, every inch of road space, um, that we are able to create a safe environment in which um, the citizens of our, of, our, of our city or our borough, not in the borough of Hackney, um, are able to take back control of the widest area of public realm possible. Um, and this has a whole range of cascading social, environmental and public health effects, um, which I'll um, potentially touch on throughout this talk if there's enough time. Um, now, in terms of my contribution to the, um, the, the, the radical reimagination of the public realm in, in Hackney, I think it would be fair to say, and I don't say this with kind of any arrogance, that um, in the four years that I was in cabinet, um, the number of kind of first and largest programmes that I delivered is probably unprecedented in um, British kind of local government history. And, you know, um, you, you, that, that it possibly explains um, some of the pushback that I received from kind of vested interests who were interested in maintaining the status quo, particularly in respect of um, surface transport. And what you'll see in this slide um is a kind of is is both a kind of a kind of compare and contrasting uh image of kind of what i tried to achieve in hackney and what my view is of um kind of um prosperous urban sustainability against you know the grandmother of urbanism who i'm sure everybody's familiar with in the room and is you know a personal kind of heroine of mine but I think, you know, there are some differences there. You know, Jane Jacobs in The Death and Life of Great American Cities, as you can see, talked about cities having the capability of providing something for everyone um, only because and only when they're created by everybody. Now, I would be tempted, and I think maybe in the fullness of time, Jane Jacobs might even be tempted to alter that to um, remove, create, remove by and replace with four. Um, and I think... What we found over the subsequent, you know, 50 or 60 years since the publication of, of that um, book is um, when you take a, an approach to the design of cities that um, encourages them to be created by everybody um, rather than driven by underlying design principles seeking to um, enhance the quality of life of, uh, of the citizens of those cities what you can what you tend to have is an is rather than a um, a holistic um, development of cities um, instead you have a, an aggregation of a huge number of individual acts whether they're acts through the planning process whether they're decisions that local highway local um, highways authorities have made whether it's decisions that um, those organizations with control over the strategic main road network have made they tend to come together in an otherwise kind of um, 
disorganized and eventually chaotic way because the um, underlying motivations of the people who've engaged in those acts in the fullness of time tend to rub up against one another. So, you know, in the case of cities, um, and, you know, hence why I kind of undertook some of the work that I did around surface transport emissions, you know, we've had um, policy at the highest levels of government that, you know, including an, an enormous road building programme over the last 30 years in particular, that have induced demand for both uh, the increased ownership of vehicles um, and the increase uh, of motor vehicles and the increased use of those motor vehicles. Um, and whilst the motor vehicle, uh, I think, can have some useful practical applications in large cities, um, they increasingly rub up against the need for other uses of land, um, for housing or for amenity, grassland amenity space. Um, and they have huge implications for um, um, greenhouse gas emissions and more locally uh, air pollution, both from tailpipe emissions, but, and this is why electric vehicles, you know, uh, are, are not the solution to the problems that we face, even around um, pollution in our cities, but from particulate matter, now over 50% of the to toxic particulate matter that urban dwellers are breathing doesn't come from tailpipes at all. It comes from tyre wear, road wear and brake wear. Um, and that is something that electric vehicles cannot eliminate. And even if they could, I think it's very important for us to understand the profound um, negative social effects that the dominance of the motor vehicle has had on our cities. But to go back to this kind of contrasting and comparing to some degree view of, uh, of, of uh, the underlying kind of philosophy of how cities should develop or how the good city should develop. Um, you can see that, um, you know, uh, that my, my short, if not kind of particularly elegant mantra is that we need to deliver good stuff for everybody. Now that seems quite trite, um, you know, and in fact, you might take the whole history of post-war politics in Britain as being a kind of marketplace in which politicians have competed to outdo one another in terms of what they can offer people at the level of the individual, more cars, bigger houses, higher salaries. But actually, when I talk about good stuff for everybody, I'm thinking about that through a lens of the climate crisis and um, the necessity to um, live uh, within the, pl the planet's kind of finite material limits. And that becomes then um, you, you know, uh, I think a much more important and urgent question, you know, how do we deliver good stuff for everybody when we know that achieving, for example, you know, an American material standard of living um, is impossible without, um, you know, precipitating a climate crisis that will lead to um, at least the uh, collapse of human civilization and possibly even the extinction of, of the human race. Um, and so, you know, my focus has been on, um, and, and, and to some degree, this is where I've been drawing on my kind of varied academic background, um, which is an undergraduate degree in civil engineering, which gives me a kind of strong commitment to understanding how things work from first principles, but also undergraduate training in economics, politics, and uh, a master's degree in an economics discipline. Uh, and this is where I think the concept of kind of non-rivalrous, non-exclusionary public goods is hugely important. So I believe that it's possible for us to, um, to live a sustainably prosperous life um, within the finite limits of the planet. But I think in order to do that, um, we need to create, um, first and foremost, uh, a wide variety of non-exclusionary, non-rivalrous public services that are of the highest standard possible. Now, what I mean by that is I'm talking about high quality um, seats of learning, but also more widely from a local government perspective. Um, libraries and other opportunities to share. Alexandra talked before about uh, the fact that uh, uh, I brought uh, the Library of Things to the London Borough of Hackney at the CLR James Library in Dalston as part of an effort to promote the sharing economy. Um, you know, do we, 
that does every house in the land needs to own a drill when, when we all use a drill about once every two years and i think the whole underlying philosophy of the library of things is that you know we can still achieve a high standard of living and enjoy a high standard of living but we can do so in a smarter way that allows us to use our resources more efficiently um, and so that's what my focus has been on in terms of the public realm um, in the London Borough of Hackney and kind of elsewhere since, you know, how do we create the conditions in which people can live a happier life, but with, with less, uh, with less materially and, you know, by less, I mean, fewer international flights or fewer short haul flights or fewer car journeys, you know, how do we create the conditions or how do we use the public ground to create the conditions in which we drastically uh, reduce um, the phenomena of 80% of uh, journeys in the UK under two kilometres being driven by car and kind of my solution to that, um, um, my solution to that, uh, to that challenge is to create environments that people wish to spend their time in, spend more of their time in and not spend their time escaping from. Um, and I think what we found in um, London during the, the pandemic and particularly throughout the lockdown period is that over the last, you know, in the post-war period, but, but since the population of London has begun to grow again, since about 1989, uh, albeit with a, with a more recent blip, and it's not quite clear where the population will go long term now. Um, you know, we have predicated the uh, development, the spatial development of London, um, and therefore also the development of its road networks um, and its green spaces on the idea that in inner London, at least at any one time, 20% of the population will be somewhere else. Um, and you know, whilst there, I think there are um, some really good examples of um, uh, prosperous urban sustainability in London, and I think Hackney, you know, perhaps I would say that is 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 amongst the best examples of that. Um, I think anyone who's ever spent time in outer London, um, you know, could understand why um, so many people spend their time working to jump on a plane and go elsewhere. Um, you know, London can be a relatively high wage economy, but it does not offer, um, you know, a particularly high standard of living in terms of the some of the, the kind of public realm um, amenities, which I'll touch on in a moment that, that I helped deliver in Hackney. Um, you know, uh, in the slide, you know, that, that you're looking at now, um, I think there'll be people in the room will possibly balk at the idea of me quoting Milton Friedman, um, and that tends to happen amongst kind of left liberals, but I think it's important that we understand um, the nature of power, um, how to exercise that power and how to change society. The left is, you know, in my experience, comprised of an inexhaustible supply of people who have got theories of change. It's an expression I absolutely loathe because I think you just go and change things if you want to change them. Don't have a theory of change. Just go and plant a tree or, you know, go and do some tactical urbanism. That's what leads to change. But, you know, they're not particular. Whilst these, th these theories of change are bound uh, in kind of progressive circles, um, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, the, the, the political tradition, um, you know, with the most, um, I think, um, uh, effective record of delivering um, change socially is the right. And I think it's important to learn from those people who've been successful at change in society. And I, you know, wholeheartedly agree with the idea that in the midst of crises, um, you know, people look to uh, not just politicians, but to wider civil society to lay the ground for a different kind of direction. Um, and, you know, as you can see from the article on the right, uh, and just to kind of, um, to emphasize the fact that I didn't kind of come up with the concept of radically reimagining the public realm for the purposes of this talk, you can see, you know, as far back as uh, February 2020, rarely before you know, the, the pandemic struck and we really knew what was going to happen or the magnitude of, of, of that event. Um, you know, I was already beginning to talk about the necessity of transforming the public realm um, in our cities to address the climate emergencies, to address urban air quality and the many other 
um, kind of negative social phenomena that arise from um, the failure of our cities to uh, to be to have been adapted for the challenges that we face in the in the 21st century, you know, the, the two most important of which and most pronounced of which will be uh, increasing urbanization and the climate crisis. Um, and so, you know, I think before I kind of go on to give some um, examples of the work that I undertook, I think that um, it's important to, to, I think, understand where the drive for these changes came from um, in order for us to um, avert the worst effects of a climate crisis, we need to radically reimagine how our cities look. The simple fact of the matter is, is our cities are overrun with motor vehicles. They do not contain uh, a sufficient amount of green infrastructure or play space or other support and infrastructure such as water fountains, for example, that allow people to operate within the public realm during extreme heat events. So what I've tried to do is almost create a template in Hackney um, for what cities can and should look like into the future. And this is a, you know, a, an unfinished piece of work and will continue to be developed further. But I think what I do and what I did was lay some of the important foundations and demonstrate some of the important kind of design principles um, and not just the kind of the, the philosophical elements of it, um, but, but almost the, the, the practical design um, principles um, you know, for the basis of that, that good life in the city. Um, and the, you know, the other reason that I think that we need to achieve that, that good life in the city is not just for the reasons that I've outlined, but because I think we will inevitably now be entering an era of what I call kind of structural responsibility in which, you know, we look back in 20 or 30 years, our children look back and think it was remarkable that the only bar to the level of environmental damage that an individual can engage in was what they could afford to damage. I think by entering that era of structural responsibility, um, you know, and, I, and I've seen this in, in Hackney and some of the, the, the work that I took around low traffic neighbourhoods, we will begin to experience a significant level of pushback from the public. And so it's necessary alongside uh, giving people the bad news around, let's say, for example, you know, things that I think um, are both necessary and inevitable, such as pricing carbon, particularly in respect of surface transport and aviation, that we also say, on the one hand, you know, um, we recognise that this, uh, you know, to some degree curtails, um, you know, what you regard as, uh, or what you have come to regard as a good life in a liberal democracy. But on the other hand, we've also, you know, transformed the cities and the towns in which you live um, to build in, you know, more play infrastructure, more opportunities to um, engage in sport and other physical activity, opportunities to engage in active travel. Um, uh, you know, uh, we, we built in green infrastructure that has a myriad of benefits, including regulating city temperatures during extreme heat events, but also uh, modulating um, the number of um, um, uh, prescriptions for prescription antidepressants that GPs um, prescribe within a particular area, even adjusted for all other factors or reducing um, certain categories of the most um, serious forms of street crime, um, such as violence and sexual crime, which disproportionately impact on women in the public realm. Uh, in any case, so kind of moving on firstly to um, the work I undertook around um, surface transport emissions uh, and transport, um, I delivered, um, depending on kind of your definition of a low traffic neighbourhood, five or 19 low traffic neighbourhoods, but I'd call them five area wide low traffic neighbourhoods covering more than 30% of the, the area of the borough. Um, the existing um, low traffic neighborhoods and mode of filters bring the number of filtered roads in Hackney up to around 50% of the borough and hopefully on a pathway to ensuring that all residential areas of the strategic main road network um, restrict through traffic um, heavily 
Um, and for people in the room who kind of don't really understand the necessity of that or why that might have been undertaken, well, there've been kind of you know a number of factors that have that have driven uh, an increase in the uh, in, in road collisions, um, a decrease in road safety on our residential roads, but probably the two most important have been in the UK. Over the last 30 years, the number of cars on our road have doubled to 40 million. Um, and as a result of that, what we've increasingly seen is cars that are passing through um, a particular conurbation in the London Borough of Hackney, almost 50% of cars on the roads at any one time are passing through the borough without stopping, um, are increasingly leaving uh, an overloaded main road network and seeking alternative routes through residential streets. And that process has been aided and abetted by the development of sat-nav technology, which has massively reduced the asymmetries of information that used to exist between drivers and maps. You know, drivers basically needed to know the roads, the back roads, to be able to use them. And that's why um, taxi drivers or black cab drivers did the knowledge, essentially. Um, well, of course, now everybody's got the knowledge in their cars. Um, and in order to shave two or three minutes off a 30-minute journey, you know, those cars have been increasingly displaced into our communities, um, you know, with huge negative social, environmental and public health effects. Um, and, you know, the, the, I suppose the, the, the top the top one in each of these categories is, you know, it's it's massively induced demand for um, uh, driving within the capital, you know, the number of miles driven on London's roads between annually, that is between 2019, sorry, 2009 and 2019 increased by almost 4 billion. I mean, that's absolutely enormous. That's the amount of miles we need to eliminate between now and 2050 in order to remain compliant with the Climate Change Committee's sixth carbon budget. Um, and what we found um, over the, the decades is that you know, politicians, local politicians in particular, in fear of the impact of uh, addressing car gluttony at the, the ballot box, um, have continually fall, fallen back on supply side measures and even then often weak supply side measures to eliminate um, to eliminate surface transport emissions and to improve road safety. Um, and whatever criticisms people might have of the largely demand side focused work that I undertook, I think what we can definitively say based on the data that I've just provided is that that approach that what I call the thoughts and prayers approach to um, surface transport has failed to address um, the growth in motor vehicles um, and the growth in um, through traffic and rat running has failed to improve uh, quality and has failed to improve road safety on every key measure through which we should measure the functionality of a transport system. The previous approach has failed. Now, my approach in Hackney has been very different. It's been a, a combination of supply side measures, um, such as um, such as uh, uh, segregated cycleways, which we can take a look at in, in, in just a second, but primarily demand side measures. And the reason for this is because I know that the motor vehicle has such a deep and broad psychological sway over um, the society in which we live. And that tends to be the case in Anglo-Saxon societies, which emphasize the primacy of the individual above society. Um, you know, the, the, the simple fact of the matter is I could you know, lay gold-plated segregated cycleways across every inch of roadway in the London Borough of Hackney. And that is not going to get men who drive 100,000 pound Range Rovers too fast through our streets out of their cars because the purpose of that car is not to get that individual from A to B. It's actually an incidental consequence. The purpose of that car and human beings respond very strongly to I suppose what Marx called social hier hieroglyphs or, um, you know, to, to semiotics, you know, it's to let everybody else in the neighborhood know how much money you've got, that's it. Um, and, you know, that individual is not going to be convinced to get onto a, a, a segregated cycleway because of the availability of one. And what we've, you know, done in recent years in particular, and, and this is, I think, kind of 
fascinating that it's that it's true that it, it, that you'll find these arguments right across the political spectrum, and I found them a lot on on the left. Is that we have harboured the notion that you know until um, you know there's a single gold-plated segregated cycleway from everyone's front door to the local town centre, we can't possibly do anything about cars. Um, and this is just a nonsense, and it's a nonsense because. Uh, until you deliver that kind of infrastructure, people won't start using it anyway and divest themselves of their vehicles for, for those individuals who are tempted to do that. Um, but it's also, you know, that that, that infrastructure um, will not be effective without um, concurrent demand side policy that actively prohibits or prices more appropriately um, driving to ensure that it reflects its full costs to society and so the work that I undertook in delivery in five low traffic neighborhoods 40 school streets and the largest number of school streets in the UK um, bus gates that prevent um, motor vehicles but allow buses through um, the elimination of um, parking um, along um, the, the main road um, network and um, to improve traffic flows for public transport um, and the delivery of uh, the UK's first geotagged uh, electric dockless bicycle bays that were displacing, at the time that I left the council, over 100 parking spaces from across uh, across the borough in favour of a much more efficient mode of transport. Uh, and by using geotagging, eliminating the pavement clutter that's been associated with some of the electric and dockless schemes. Um, so you can see in the top, and a uh, top left or my top left hand corner. Um, the, an example of the, the the modal filters, the open modal filters that I delivered in Hackney, um, and they're that, that operated under what's known as ANPR, which is Automatic Number Plate Recognition Software. Now, um, uh, personally, I think that a combination of completely closed and completely open filters, so completely closed, physically closed filters, which provide no opportunities for any vehicle to pass through, even emergency service vehicles, and we've got lots of those historically in Hackney and AMPR operated filters are best rather than the third way, if you will, of kind of lockable bollards. And anyone who's followed the LTN debate in London will, will know that the, 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 the situation in which um, inexplicably firemen or firefighters um, and emergency service workers suddenly discovered that they don't know how to operate a key on a uh, an unlockable bollard has been a source of um, you know uh, material with which uh, opponents have attacked low traffic neighborhoods so you know I tended to implement uh, open filters with automatic number plate recognition systems and of course the elegant um, um, feature of those is that they generate quite a lot of ring fenced money in uh, I mean the, the, the number of um, penalty charge notices falls by about 90% after two weeks. So they're effective in discouraging um, through traffic, but they also continue to generate revenue, which is ring fenced and can only be plowed back into development of the transport network. Um, so you've you know also developed a completely new um, source of revenue um, for further reimagination of the public realm. Um, but as I said, you know, I'm not completely against the delivery of um, uh, supply side measures at all. And I think good quality segregated cycling infrastructure is hugely important and is you know, probably the only way you will get a very large number of cyclists onto the roads because it's just not safe for cyclists to, to, to share um, the, 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 the streets with, uh, you know, metal boxes weighing two tons, you know, which is why um you know um drivers kill um, almost 600 cyclists and pedestrians um uh, every year in the uk but as you can see at the bottom of this screen this is queensbridge road um very large um kind of arterial road which runs through the middle of, of hackney previously clogged with motor vehicles uh, on either side as you can see they're also restricting the flow of traffic the cars are entering the hatched area, which should be um, clear. And this is an example of how car gluttony, um, you know, far from even improving prospects for drivers, has in the fullness of time, um, you know, contributed to unsustainable levels of congestion in our cities. And then on the right, or on my right anyway, you can see the segregated cycle infrastructure that was put in place, which improves the availability of road space for those essential vehicles that are traveling through the middle of Hackney, commercial vehicles, emergency services, <clears throat> etc. Um, but also 
um, you know, has created space on both sides of the road um, for uh, um, uh, for safe cycling and has done so in a way that's taking space away from parked motor vehicles rather than space away from pedestrians. Um, and so, you know, there's another a kind of important design principle. Um, it's almost, a, I'm trying to think of what the, the, the economics concept is and it'll, it'll come to me only after this, this, this tour. Ah, Pareto optimality, right. So for anyone who studied economics and they'll have heard of Pareto optimality, you know, that's one of the design principle or that's one of the theories that have influenced my ideas about the design of public realm that we shouldn't deliver any additional infrastructure um, to aid one sustainable form of transport if that takes away um, infrastructure from another form of sustainable transport um, that we should always focus on what the major problem is here which is the the cars parked on either side of the road and the fact that there are too many motor vehicles rather than you know taking half of the pavement away from pedestrians to create cycle tracks for cyclists because the the the, the net effect of that is to reduce um, or to maintain the same level of provision for or to reduce the level of provision for for, for pedestrians uh, in order to improve provision for cyclists while doing absolutely nothing to uh, to 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 address the the status quo of uh, the dominance of the motor vehicle now moving on very quickly because I, I think i said i was going to talk for half an hour i've probably been talking for half an hour already i just thought i'd provide you with a a kind of brief insight into some of the work that I undertook around green infrastructure and the effects that that has on kind of visual amenity in the public realm. So I delivered the largest, as Alexandra noted earlier, the largest uh, urban tree programme in the UK, um, some 5,000 street trees um, and um, 30,000 kind of saplings through a, um, a relationship with um, the excellent charity Trees for Cities, the 5,000 street trees cost almost £5 million. Um, and people think, oh my God, how can trees cost that much? Well, it's about £1,000 a specimen when you include groundworks and root direction um, and two years of aftercare. Um, but, you know, this is amongst the um, both the cheapest and the most um, radical um, form of public realm intervention you can take is to to tear up the ground. I'm, I'm tempted to, to quote Wild Style from uh, the Lego movie. And for anyone who has children, you will have witnessed that film. It's kind of like insidiously political. Um, but there's a moment where she says, you know, break the ground. I mean, literally tear it up. Everyone has, has the ability to be a groundbreaker. And one of the things that you can do, one of the most radical things that you can do uh, in a city uh, is to to tear out the hard standing and to plant living things in there as living things humanize people um, and we know for example that the closer people are to green spaces and to green infrastructure the more likely people are to be aware of the needs of the broader biosphere rather than just the needs of individuals it humanizes people right but the, 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 the benefits of street trees go incredibly wide, right? And it's not, you know, as I've noted before, this isn't merely about the most advanced technology honed by millions of years of evolution for regulating um, temperatures during extreme heat events through evapotranspiration and shading. Um, we also know that basically humans evolved to be around trees and it has profound mental health and social effects on people being close to green infrastructure. So as I've noted before, but I talk quite quickly and I'm from Liverpool and people might not always understand what I've said. Um, you know, in addition to the environmental benefits that trees provide, and I haven't even touched upon the air filtration effects of, of banks of street trees. Now, of course, the challenge and the, and the, the ultimate goal is to eliminate the sources uh, of poor air quality in cities, and they go much wider, actually, than cars, although cars are a major contributing factor. People wouldn't know, for example, that takeaways and particulate matter that comes from takeaways, um, including small um, kind of... Uh, particulate level um, fats and um, essentially kind of PM10 and PM2.5 from foodstuffs make a huge contribution to air quality in our cities. You know, nitrous oxide, um, oh, sorry, nitrogen dioxide. Nitrous oxide is another problem altogether in cities, but I won't get into that now. Nitrogen dioxide 
from um, the flues of um, gas fire boilers may, you know, makes an enormous contribution to poor air quality. But if we stick to PM, a particulate matter, I got you know PM two point five and PM tens, the, the the smallest particulate matter, and that we're breathing in in our cities. Um, then trees like the ones on the left, and um, the tall ones on the left in the central reservation of a very busy road that's Mare Street. For anyone who kind of knows Hackney, um, you know they're dawn redwoods, um, and you know they're part of um, you know they're part of a family of trees that has an absolutely enormous surface area. Coniferous trees in general do, and they're very good at um, filtering particulate matter, like a kind of sponge. Um, and uh, and so that's why at this particular location where we've got the kind of London uh, College of Fashion and, you know, uh, large number of workplaces, I was very focused on delivering um, green infrastructure at a constrained location. Now, you will also notice that these um, trees are not placed within kind of weedy, um, kind of sad looking small tree pits um, that when, you know, I've gone into the ground, I've created rainwater gardens, such as the one in the middle, um, or central reservations with extra large and continuous tree pits. And the reason for that um, is not just because it allows you to significantly increase the quantum of green infrastructure in a really efficient way. So you see around the roots of these trees, you're getting so many other uh, plant species in at those locations um, with, with, with enormous uh, biodiversity ecosystem services provided, but also because um, uh, removing um, uh, hard stand in our cities is an absolute necessity if we are to uh, mitigate against the worst effects of extreme heat events. So, you know, concrete and other hard stand materials, so hard standing materials effectively acts like a giant storage heater in our cities and it stores our heat during extreme heat events all day long. And it does not begin to release that heat until. Um, ambient temperatures fall below the temperature of the material itself, something to do with the law of ther thermodynamics that none of us need to understand, or you probably understand, but I don't. So it then begins to release it, and it does that over an evening. And the, the determining factor of peak daytime temperatures uh, is the extent to which you can reduce nighttime temperatures, and obviously hard standing materials mitigate against that, which exacerbate extreme heat events. So again, you know, um, green infrastructure isn't merely about planting things in the ground or putting things in new things. It's also about removing materials that we have only latterly come to realise um, as uh, having a, a you know a, 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 a significantly negative impact during extreme weather events. And of course. Um, you know, uh, uh, creating a large proportion of rainwater gardens in a city area also mitigates against the potential for um, high precipitation events. Now, you know, I'm not against, of course, just planting trees because they're beautiful. I mean, I think I'd turn that approach on its head. I think when I entered local government, it's remarkable, really. I mean, as a, an elected politician, which wasn't really that long ago, even 2014, you know, certainly in Hackney, and I think that it still exists today, you know, trees and green infrastructure is regarded purely through the lens of aesthetics. Um, and therefore, it's one of the first areas of local government services to be uninvested in or disinvested in um, during um, uh, difficult financial times. Um, and so, you know, um, you know, I absolutely see green infrastructure, which is why I call it green infrastructure, which is a kind of quite an arid way to describe something as beautifully evolved as, as trees, as something that is as important as public transport infrastructure or housing in a city. I mean, we absolutely have to understand, you know, um, uh, green infrastructure is public health infrastructure, and we have hitherto not done that, but I'm not against the idea of considering, um, you know, the delivery of green infrastructure just purely for the purposes of human happiness. Of course, that spits out huge savings in terms of public health costs, but, you know, there's a value to just doing things because they make you happy anyway. And as you can see in the pictures from Pitfield Street, that was the space that I inherited in the middle of Hackney. And I took over responsibility for public realm. And the image below is one that I took, um, I think, in March this week, well, uh, March this year, as I took Create Streets on a, on a walkabout of um, 
of Hackney's green infrastructure as part of the green infrastructure advisory panel and a report they're working on at the moment. And you can just see how much more that space is. I mean, you it, it, obviously there's, there's somebody sitting on the grass at the top. There's very limited amenity value to, to the space originally, and it provides virtually no shading whatsoever. So people will not be able to enjoy that space during the summer months because there's too much exposure to sunlight. Um, and you can see that um, in, in, a in a relatively small space, we've managed to derive much more ecosystem, a, a much higher level of ecosystem services, including shading, which allow uh, year-round enjoyment of that space, and the kind of rewilding of the margins of that space as well to improve um, ecosystem services for biodiversity. Um, I'm going to canter on and kind of, how long have I been talking, um, Alexandra? Uh, I was going to say, you've only got 10 minutes left, so I okay, wonder let me whether... run through this very quickly, then I'll give Amazing. you 10 minutes. Um, I mean, this might have been an absolutely dreadful ramble, and I've missed off the best part, but um, it, it, as with all of these talks, they start to become um, really important whenever you begin to think about them deeply. So I think, you know, one of the other kind of design um, principles that I've tried to integrate into the public realm uh, to achieve a variety of outcomes was to maintain a high level of playfulness. I think our cities lack playfulness. I think that play is a concept in Britain, which we kind of attribute squarely to children. Um, and I think there's a whole theory of play beginning to emerge now and around why humans why, why, why it's good for human development to, to play at all ages because it helps foster improved uh, relationships, um, social relationships, um, and um, you know, it tends to mitigate against the effects of, 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 of things like loneliness, which we know is a um, which we know is a is, is also a major crisis in the Western world, and particularly within kind of urban environments, but kind of paradoxically. So you can see here examples of um, kind of natural play equipment. Uh, I've removed a lot of the um, kind of previously existing kind of rubber crumb, which is effectively just the the tire industry, um, you know, polluting children's playgrounds with material that should otherwise be um, incinerating or recycling. Uh, I remove that because it releases volatile organic compounds and it becomes very hot during extreme heat events, um, and it generally um you know ages very badly in favor of natural play equipment which uh, is much easier integrated into green spaces uh, and provides children with more opportunities for creative play rather than kind of designing in what kind of play they should in, you know undertake at the outset so you'll see with a lot of older kind of playgrounds there'll be a slide there'll be a swing there'll be a roundabout if you're lucky on those that play equipment you can slide you can swing or you can play on the roundabout and go round and round that usually bores children above about three years old within about five minutes um and yet what we've done here through or what i've kind of tried to do whenever i kind of reimagine play spaces is to create spaces that people from six to 60 and over could enjoy and um, that there were opportunities for fitness um, but there were also opportunities for play, but also that we created the circumstances in which children could make their own fun or people could make their own fun. So playfulness was very important. Now, the image on the right is a King's Crescent estate. Uh, now, I wasn't responsible for that. It was part of a, the, the redevelopment of an existing estate, most of which was retrofitted. Uh, if anyone wants to read about this, there's excellent coverage of it in the New York Times, which kind of held it up as an example of how um american social housing could develop but you can see here uh, a, a pre-existing street was completely eliminated turned effectively into a small low traffic neighborhood in effect and the ground repurposed for the purposes of play um you know i'm not the kind of person who believes that children should only be playing on grass i think that you know, they, they, when, when cars are, are not in the locale, um, you know, children and parents want children to play close to home. And historically, that's something that's happened. And what we've sought to do here is recreate the kind of environment that would have existed in London before the explosion in the ownership of motor vehicles after the Second World War. Um, and it's proven to be very successful. Um, sort of very finally, some fire, you know, kind of other interventions and um, uh, kind of design elements, which I think 
um, are really important for the public realm and for maintaining a high degree of happiness in the public realm. Um, it is focusing on quality. Um, you know, not all planters are created equally. I work with Meristam Design to bring in these oxidized steel planters. They look much better than the plastic ones or the concrete ones. Now, in the fullness of time, you want to remove planters altogether because they're not a sustainable way to grow trees um, and they take a lot more revenue costs. Um, but when you undertake these interventions in the public realm, you know, you should at least be... Um, making an effort not to brute wise. I've seen some LTNs that have put concrete bollards in place. I think if I was a non-driver um, and I lived in a conservation area, um, I might be disinclined to support a low traffic neighborhood because they've plonked concrete bollards in there. I think there are better ways of doing that. The second example is a, a parklet. Again, I think parklets are potentially politically problematic because what they do not do is by failing to tear up the ground, um, they can potentially be a kind of benign interregnum between different eras of parking, depending on who comes to power in within an administration. That park that's in the middle of the screen could be pulled up tomorrow and a car could be parking there five minutes later. So if you really want to re radically reimagine the public realm, you've got to get the jackhammer out. That being said, parklets in areas, I mean, this is Wilton Way in, near London Field, parklets in areas close to small businesses are something that I am hugely supportive of because um, they're effectively separate structures that you can build seating into. And so they, they, they displace cars, but they also serve to um, support local small businesses by expanding the availability of space. And you can see how popular this particular parklet is for customers, how much business it's generated for small businesses, which is why Hackney, unlike other local authorities up and down the land, is a, is a borough of thriving small businesses um, rather than a wasteland of empty retail units. Uh, and then a, a kind of final point on kind of um, um, public realm, uh, on kind of... Um, so I suppose what I call immunity interventions, um, you know, I delivered the largest uh, program of um, uh, free drinking water fountains in Hackney. Unfortunately, the pandemic hit just afterwards, and that was an opportunity for the single use plastics drinks industry to uh, kind of reframe their products as kind of um kind of covid free products and it may be some time before we get back to a situation in which people feel comfortable uh, drinking on the street and refilling their bottles but we are absolutely going to have to have that infrastructure in place not just in our town district and local centers but probably on many um, residential streets as well to support people due through kind of extreme heat events and of course to provide a cheap and sustainable alternative to walking into a shop to buy uh, you know half a litre of coke from a plastic bottle made from oil and then a very very final point because I can see Alexandra's eye is now beginning to twitch with me although I'm very happy to stay longer for people I'm sure you're all very busy is all of the design elements to which I've referred come together in the form of what I call the 21st century street. And this was a design that I worked on for delivery of Calverstone Crescent, which is immediately adjacent to Ridley Road Market. Again, for people who know Hackney, you'll know where that is. Um, it's at the Kingsland end of, of Ridley Road Market. And basically, um, hopefully you can see my cursor, but basically um, what we had here is a long-standing issue of cars driving up Calverstone Crescent, um, many of which kind of belong to market traders or for people who were kind of thought they'd just run into the market, um, idling their engines, dangerous kind of uh, three-point turns uh, occurring at this end, uh, significant impacts on uh, amenity value of the street for residents and for the children at Calverstone Primary School just here, which have no access to outdoor space, uh, sorry, um, outdoor green space, um, and, um, uh, you know, created a kind of non-space of perpendicular parking where the noses of cars are parked to the curb, um, and, um, you know, was, was, was providing a kind of haven for um, anti-social behaviour and uh, criminal activity. And what I found about Calverstone Crescent, and we have a controlled parking zone there, that's a very important part of how you eliminate surface transport emissions in cities, is that only 40% of the residents of that street actually owned the car. Um, so what I decided to do was create a design that eliminated around 50% of the road space 
from cars um, so that the people who continue to own a car would still be able to park in the locale. Uh, but I also found that the overwhelming majority of these houses, which have been converted, contain flats in which people have no access to outdoor space. So I created uh, or the designed, the, and it will be delivered sometime I think this year, uh, designed um, the, the, the small um, rainwater garden with green space and seating spaces for people. Um, and then as part of this process, also built in semi-secure cycle storage, secure cycle storage, 40% tree canopy cover, because 40% tree canopy cover is the minimum level at which um, the relationship between canopy cover and air temperatures begins to break down. Once you go above 40% canopy cover, you start to benefit from increasing marginal returns. So for every 5% canopy cover you go up, you reduce temperatures by 10% in the locale. Um, so that's why that 40% is a really important minimum. Um, and we still retain the use of the street for um blue badge holders and for and for residents who own a parking permit but i think uh and this is the reason i've included this image at the end i think this includes you know it, it, i think this comprises many of the elements that i tried to deliver i think a bit more diffusely across the borough and it's my view that um for us to create that kind of um the good city um that is perhaps less internationally mobile and less mobile in terms of motor vehicles than it you know, was in previous decades, we're going to need to radically reimagine our streets for the purposes of um, human happiness rather than human transit by private motor vehicle. And I'm going to call it a day there.